What do y'all fear more than some sick, evil guy with an AR-15 shooting people in a crowd? Is there something more scary than that? Government. I mean, th this, you begin to restrict media. You take away the people's rights to defend themselves. That is tyranny. If, if you want to live in China, you want to live in Russia, you want to live in Cuba, you want to live in Venezuela, that's what this country will become if we slowly begin to cede our right to keep and bear arms. Again, John, there is no liberty. There is no freedom without the ability to preserve those things. The gun makes us even. I don't care what you look like. The gun makes us all even. We can never relinquish that. Hey, this video is sponsored by Sportsman's Guide. I like to shop Sportsman's Guide for all of my end of the world, apocalyptic, boogaloo, zombies are definitely coming to eat your brains kind of shopping. So you got survival gear and some military surplus stuff. So make sure you check it out. Use code WARPOET at checkout. Saves you some cheddar. And now back to the video. All right, what's happening folks? Today we have an exciting video plan where we're answering the most common anti-gun sentiments. What everyone out there in real world 2021 is upset about regarding guns. There's lots of gun law controversy on the docket. And so we wanted to be able to talk with all you fine folks about this. From Gun Owners of America, we have John and Kaylee. Thanks for joining us. And from Guns Out, Sure Michael and John. What is Guns Out? So Guns Out, I mean, we are a I like to call it a firearms humanization platform. <laughs> That's what we do. We humanize the idea of firearms. Um, I mean, we could have kept this really fun and very lighthearted and comical, but we like to deploy a level of information and that's why I partnered with this fine gentleman right here because he's just a wealth of knowledge from a political standpoint, from an uh, all-around educational standpoint. And we bring together a synergy that really just um, portrays firearms in a positive light. And, and John, what we really realized, I mean, 2020 African Americans were the fastest growing demographic group of new firearm purchasers in the whole country. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes what I realized in shooting, a lot of people say, man, we wish we saw more people like you shooting. Like we want to expand and grow the community. Mm -hmm. That's yep. how you reach new people. And so we realize you have these folks who are out there, John, they don't know a lot about guns, who's educating them, who's bringing them along the journey. And so in, in my view, I see it as a gateway drug. Mm -hmm. I literally see it as, as, as a black man who's proud to say I'm a conservative. I see introducing other African Americans into firearms, into the 2A world, allows us to start pulling them into a further, bigger conversation mm -hmm. about other things. And, and, and so I think that's what's so pivotal and, and key about what we're trying to do is educating people, having a great time, but certainly educating these new people who don't know a lot and saying there's a larger community here who are wait, waiting yeah. to welcome you. I mean, man, there's so many of your followers and supporters have reached out, uh, you know, saying, wow, I just figured out about your show from whatever platform. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of what you guys are doing. I'm proud to see two black guys doing this. You guys go and teach other people in your community about how welcoming we are as a community. Exactly. That's why we're doing yeah, this. Yeah, it works, it works twofold because it shows, you know, our, it shows people like us you know, when they, they relate to when they see someone like themselves doing something that they might have thought that didn't exist. Like, Sir Michael, um, that one story about the guy in New York, and he, he, he saw this guy all the time, and he never knew he was a hunter. There's, there's a black guy yeah. talking to mm -hmm. another black guy. Mm -hmm. Never thought he was a hunter. And then after, like, maybe weeks and weeks and weeks of conversing with this guy on the pass by, found out that he was a hunter, and he's like, wow, I never thought you, I've never pictured you being a hunter. It's like he never asked. Yeah. You know, so I mean, as simple as that. So our platform shows it twofold. It shows us being interested in this, and then it also shows the firearms community embracing us for what we're yeah. doing. Without further ado, I want to jump in and immediately tackle some of these. Everybody ready to go? Let's go. Let's do it. All right. How about AR-15s are weapons of war, and if anyone has them, the planet will explode. Uh, I paraphrased the objection, but how about that? AR-15s are weapons of war. They don't belong on our streets. Falsity, falsity, falsity. The AR-15, was, which was created in the 1950s, designed by Eugene Stoner, a lead designer at Armalite. Again, AR-15 does not stand for assault rifle. Most of you folks know that. It stands for Armalite rifle, John. And it's so funny that many of the people who are advocating for the removal of the AR don't know the basic facts of history about this weapon, which is, by the way, the most popular weapon in the country right now. But regardless of the background, or maybe mm -hmm. we got the naming convention wrong, why would anyone need 
something like that that looks so scary with so many rounds. Sporting, hunting, self-defense. Like I have a girlfriend. My girlfriend's a pretty small frame woman. Yeah, a shotgun would be great, but it is so easy for her, John, to pick up an AR and defend herself if she absolutely had to at home by herself. And I feel very confident and comfortable with her being able to have that capability. So it's a great equalizer. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of equalizer, women, I'm five foot tall. Pretty much any guy who wants to could beat me up, take me anywhere, you know, whatever. And so me having a firearm is what gives me the ability to be empowered, to not be fearful of, oh my goodness, I'm gonna, you know, something's gonna happen to me. And, um, you know, on college campus, you know, I graduated in 2018. And so I was tabling for a Second Amendment group on, on the campus at the time. And this six foot three guy, uh, comes up and is talking about, you know, oh, you don't need the Second Amendment, you know, you're safe, you're a protected, and um, proceeds to dump a 44 ounce blue slushy because he was upset that I wasn't woke enough for the free speech zone on campus. And he proved my point. And I actually reached out my hand and, and tried to shake his. I'm like, thank you. They, they live in this alternate universe, this utopia. Well, if we just get rid of all of the guns, everyone's gonna be safe and everyone's gonna be secure. We don't live in that rainbow and butterfly. I don't know what to say. On, <laughs> on, on your head, yeah. You've, you left out, he dumped a 44 ounce blue slushy on your head. Yeah, yeah. Six foot three, five foot woman. Yeah. T -t Talk about bullying, right? I mean, you, criminals will always figure out a way to commit crime. I mean, always. You, you look at the United Kingdom, they don't have guns, but knives. Yeah. Japan, knives. I mean, it, it's naive to think that people who want to cause harm and destruction are all of a sudden going to say, you know what, there are no more guns, I have to be a good person now. And I think that's a great point, and, and to, to follow on Kaylee's point, uh, if you could magically make all guns disappear, just snap your fingers and no one in the world had a gun, would the world be a safer place or a more dangerous place? And I would suggest it would be far more dangerous when the physically strong can do what they will to the physically weak. And John, we don't have a bill of needs. Uh, but, uh, we have a bill of rights. You know, why does anyone need a Ferrari? Mm -hmm. you know, when a Volkswagen will do. Um, it's not about needs, it's about what our rights are. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, AR-15s and, and all types of guns are used successfully in, in self-defense hundreds of thousands of times a year uh, in this country. But, but the bottom line is, is it's, in, it's in our rights, it's our natural, inherent, individual right to own what we want to own. And the government, you know, the, the founding fathers have four simple words to clarify this. It's not hard to understand shall not be infringed. And when you start touching AR-15s or large capacity magazines or any type of weapon, it's an infringement. And that's where the problem is. A right taken away is never given back. And John, I have a question for you. I mean, you've been to war. Have you used an AR-15 on the battlefield? No. No. So when did it become a weapon of war? Well, because, because it, 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 they utilize these types of terms and phrases to get emotional appeals out of people, to get them to turn against the weapons. The, the, this is basic, progressive, Saul Dielinsky, Marxist terminology in order to turn people away from the things they don't know. John, when a person fears something, they immediately close their mind to being educated to what this thing is. They immediately close their minds to, well, maybe there are some good things for having this. And that's what certain people who are against our right to keep and bear arms are doing to essentially turn the country against. You cannot have freedom. You cannot have liberty without the ability to defend freedom, to defend liberty. And it is naive for any person to think that you can take a weapon away and that's going to be it. Yeah. Well, I can guarantee you, you will begin to see every single individual freedom and liberty that we all cherish slowly being taken away. It will not stop. Got it, but couldn't you accomplish the same thing with something like a pistol? Because what if some evil psychopath, active killer, got a hold of one of these high capacity AR-15 weapons of war? Oh, it pains me so much to say all this. <laughs> I'm like, inside my soul is like, twisting and turning as I'm forced to play devil's advocate. And y'all are all like teaming up on me and I don't appreciate, hey, I'm on your side. Hey, you're the one no. asking the question. All right, you ask the question. let me continue to ask. What if one of these evil people 
got their hands on one of these AR-15s and you got 30 rounds in there and they're pumping rounds into a crowd. Shouldn't we fear that? And wouldn't it be better to just eliminate all the AR-15s for the public safety? No, it, it would be better for more people to have access to guns. Because if, if you think about most of the times when these mass shootings occur, they usually occur in quote unquote gun free zones. Most of these folks are not going somewhere where they know people are armed and packing because I can guarantee you, yeah, maybe you'll get one person. Maybe you'll get two, but I guarantee you, you're not making it out of there alive. So what do they do? They usually go to places where the people are unassuming, minding their business. I want to empower as many people as I can to have a gun. They should. I think we're safer when more people have guns because I translate gun ownership to being responsible. I translate gun ownership to perseverance. All of the type of, of, of skill sets that I envision a decent person would want to maximize to live the greatest life, you sit in gun ownership with the practicing, with the training, with the continuous learning. And John, you could tell that or ask that question to Stephen Williford, who used an AR-15 in Sutherland Springs, Texas, to stop a massacre in progress at a church at a there. Church. Yep. And, and he, in barefoot and all, ran out and confronted uh, the attacker, and he will tell you that if he had a, a 45 or 9 millimeter handgun, he probably would be dead. He needed that AR-15 that day. Fun story. I did ask Stephen Williford that. We have a video. <laughs> we, just, we have a video where Stephen Williford, we, we here of Sutherland <laughs> Springs, uh, literally, we, we sat down with him. He told his story. Amazing. Wow. Amazing dude. So how about that? I have a YouTube channel. How about that? Right? I feel great. It's like not so. I felt like I should have adjusted my glasses and said, well, actually. <laughs> uh, very good. What do y'all fear more than some sick, evil guy with an AR-15 shooting people in a crowd? Is there something more scary than that? Government. Yeah, not, well, government. not having a gun to defend myself from that. Government. I mean, th this, you begin to restrict media. You take away the people's rights to defend themselves. That is tyranny. If you want to live in China, you want to live in Russia, you want to live in Cuba, you want to live in Venezuela, that's what this country will become if we slowly begin to cede our right to keep and bear arms again. John, there is no liberty. There is no freedom without the ability to preserve those things. The gun makes us even. I don't care what you look like. The gun makes us all even. We can never relinquish that. Why aren't you passionate at all about this? I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm I want to. I want to know why you don't give a crap about the gun stuff. <laughs> no, it, it is it is interesting because we did our mic checks and you were kind of like doing this beforehand. And he's kind of like, "Hello, my name." is... Yeah, John, you're just not gonna let that go. Are my you? name yeah. is Sure Michael, and I'm doing my mic check. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sorry, but now you're kind of like up on plane, <laughs> and I need my gut. You know, uh, it's you're getting passionate. Right? I, I am, and I, I think everybody should get passionate about. I like this that now. because I mean, you are an interesting case. You have a background in politics. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, so my background is political, uh, from Romney campaign to the Ging. I know Romney's not a big guy right now among many of ours. Uh, Gingrich, Dr. Carson. I served in the Trump administration as the deputy chief of staff at HUD. So my background is all political. And the way I look at this landscape is truly through that political lens. I look at it through a, uh, almost like a tactician. And I'm trying to figure out, as I look at the other side, what maneuvers are they doing that we perhaps need to outpace them? Almost like you're playing a game of chess almost. And, and I think where they're winning, John, is on emotion. Because the facts don't bear. The, they say, oh, well, X amount of people have been killed by AR-15s. We banned ARs for, what, 10 years? Automatic weapons ban? You think that stopped mass shootings? People were using pistols. Then they say, well, what about inner city violence? Inner city violence, most of those incidents, one, are occurring with a pistol. Most black folks aren't shooting with ARs. I'm just going to be frank about that. Number three, that's an issue of education. That's an issue of family. That's an issue of poverty. But they point these wedge issues to pit certain groups of people against each other, John, because they can't win the argument otherwise. They can't win the argument based off facts, so let me appeal to emotion. We have to be smarter than that. We have to outpace and outmaneuver them. That's great. It's Marxism 101. It is. It's to make us afraid mm -hmm. and then to divide us, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And if we can get fighting amongst ourselves, then the, the government, which makes the problem, steps in and yeah. says, and behold, I'm here to help. I'll rescue you from your problems that we created. The, big, uh, the, the biggest, Ronald Reagan said this, the scariest thing in the world is 
someone saying, I'm the government and I'm here to help. Right. You better close your door and run away. The government is never here to help. I will give you an example. African American, that's obvious, right? We had the war on poverty back in the 1960s. If you calculate the amount of money we spent today, over a trillion dollars on poverty, you look at most black cities in this country, they're still impoverished. Education's still crappy. They're still, you, you cannot rely on government. Government's never been able to do anything effectively that we, the people, have not been able to do on our own. Uh, collect taxes. I've noticed the government's well, very yeah. good at taxes. <laughs> Again, our money, that's all. right? <laughs> that's all, but they're very good at but, taxes. But that's, but that's, that's about it. I, I think what makes America so unique and so different, and there's been a lot of interesting, fascinating societies throughout the history of mankind, none quite like ours. And I think what makes ours so unique, one is our belief in God. We, we believe in a higher power. We, we believe that there is something that gives us our freedom. And the freedom doesn't come from man. It doesn't come from the government. It comes from the creator. That's why it's in the Constitution. Uh, two, we're a place where we say anybody is welcome if you believe in our values. You can't come here and say, well, I'm going to bring some communist Chinese bullcrap or I'm going to bring in some Marxist bullcrap. You have to come and say, I am going to embrace and believe in the ideals that make America great. And then finally, I would say that we're a place of community. I think you've been all over the world, John. You look at, again, China, India with the caste system. You look at all these different places and, and just how nuanced and complicated different groups of people can't even reside next to each other. In America, you could be white, you could be black, you could be Asian, living next to each other, working next, nobody cares as long as you're a decent person, as long as you're taking care of your family, as long as you're contributing to the community, as long as you believe in the ideals of this country. That's what makes this place so unique. The founders, while not perfect men, understood that the document that they were crafting was going to be something that would supersede the test of time. Romans couldn't do it. The Greeks couldn't do it. The Byzantines couldn't do it. The Russians couldn't do it. The Chinese draw their various. None of those folks could, could do it. But guess what? We did. We're still doing it. But my concern, John, is that we're stepping away from that. We can never step away from that because if we do, we'll go the way of all those other empires in the past. Interesting. All right, so I've heard this argument a lot. If we outlawed guns, if it saves even just one life, then it's worth it. Because it's all about saving lives, right? We need to rescue people. Doesn't matter that the, you know, like I was thinking about nice France, mm -hmm. uh, when that dude got in a van and ran over, what did he kill, 84 yeah. people or something mm -hmm. like that? Mm -hmm. That's way worse than any of our active killer deaths. 84, like he did it with a van. Will you get outlaw vans? Or you blame the van? Regardless, sorry, I'm answering my own question because right. it's irritating. It's it like, is. man, how can you suck at thinking so bad? <laughs> When you look at all the statistics, all the other deaths trump firearm deaths. Yeah. All yeah. of them. I mean, the hands and feet deaths, I think they're like, what, five yeah, times? Yeah, Colin Noir tweeted out yeah, something like, yeah. five times as much as firearms deaths. Wow. I mean, I mean it, look, logic, if common sense was so common, it wouldn't, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Well, it's not common. common sense, right, then. I don't know. It's not <laughs> common. We don't use logic anymore, John. And again, people use these talking points for fear. They try to make people afraid. But you know what? I know the people who are watching this video aren't afraid. I know the people who are watching this video want to educate people. I know the people who are watching this video are decent, good people who simply want to say, I just want to protect myself. Mm -hmm. That's great. I just enjoy shooting my gun. I'm not bothering anybody. I'm not trying to intrude on anyone's life. I just want to be me, be happy. That's what America is supposed to be about, John. Yeah, and no gun owner is searching for that active shooter situation. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh man, I hope today's the day that I'm gonna get to be the hero. No one rationally uh -oh. thinks like oh. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, especially not John. Especially not John, level no, three. But to your point, it, it's, a good, it's a good point. It's no, a good point. no, it's a really good point. And that's, that's the part I remember we had a conversation about misinformation. And the misinformation out there is that. They think that people that go to the range, people that partake in firearms mm -hmm. pastimes are literally looking yeah. for trouble or looking yeah. to be a vigilante, looking to be a right. hero, something like that. Yeah. And that's not the case at all. You know, right. I mean, until I really picked up firearms and, and really started to practice and be more proficient at it, I really, I, I did not understand that this is something that is enjoyable, that it, it brings camaraderie. That's Some good. of the yeah. nicest people you meet right. are on the range. 
They're sharing knowledge with you. Hey, man, you want to shoot my gun? You want to try my gun? Hey, what's that you got over there? I mean, you have some of the most pleasant conversations yeah. with people in the firearms community. Yeah, and that's, that's a terrible misconception that people have yep. about people yep. who like to partake in firearms. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I'm thinking of the G.K. Chesterton quote uh, where he says, uh, soldier fights not because he hates what's in front of him, but because he loves what's behind him. And that really is warrior poet ethos for the folks walking in. All jokes aside, it's we're not looking for violence. We're not looking to bully. We just love people. We want to make the world a safer place and protect. And so I'm just covering down on like uh, I carry concealed. But most of the reason I carry concealed is it because I want the opportunity to use it? It's not even because I think I'm going to get attacked. I don't think people are, I don't think the bad guy's targeting me. I really don't. I don't think I've got the right whatever. I don't think they're after me. It's more of what if something went sideways on my watch and I wasn't ready to save lives? I don't think I'd ever recover from that. So it's a guilt thing for me as I am built as a sacred protector of people. I'm a lover and protector of people. So I carry a gun as part of that calling and I feel guilty when I don't. It's because, no, 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 I am placed and built in such a way that I am here to protect, and we're playing zone. So typically, whenever I meet somebody out there, of like, hey, warrior poet, John Lope, you know, and it happens probably every day I'm out now, which means we're spreading and growing. That's awesome, but I'll always ask, are you carrying? Are, are you carrying? And they're like, oh yeah, well I got it in the truck. I'm like, which doesn't count, right? which doesn't count. And I'm like, and what I'm not trying to do is shame them. It's kind of like, dude, we got to play zone. This world's becoming a, a, a dangerous place. And you know, we're, the world has always been a dangerous place. Uh, but uh, there's protectors. There's a bunch of us out there. You're meant to play zone. Don't give up your guns. That's giving up your calling, you know, like, are you a loving protector or not? Stay that way. Don't disarm, ever. Yeah, L Lieutenant Colonel David Grossman, who, who wrote a book on this, and several, uh, but he, he would point out that most people in America are sheep. They're good people, nice people, without the ability to protect themselves. But a few of us are sheep dogs, the Stephen Williford's uh, of the world, people like yourself. Um, and, and it's our responsibility to protect not only ourselves, but those around us, uh, should that unfortunate situation ever occur in our, you know, under our watch. Very good. Uh, your gun owners of America, what are you guys doing in more of the political area? You guys are activists, obviously pro 2A, that's what you do. What are you guys doing uh, in this fight? Yeah, we, we are a political organization, grassroots uh, nationwide. We have over 2 million members and supporters. Um, we're known as the uh, no compromise uh, gun lobby in Washington. Uh, for the reason uh, that the Second Amendment is very clear in, it, in, it, in its intent and, and its restriction on the government to us, we the people. You know, because you know, we are the ones who form this government. We're the sovereigns. And we understand that the purpose of government was laid out by the Founding Fathers. You look at, at the, the Declaration of Independence. We have life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, then uh, dot, dot, dot. How, what is the government's role? is in order to secure these rights. That's the role of the government. It's not to take away our guns. You know, when, when, we, when there are violent uh, situations, you know, when, the, when there are uh, disasters and uh, um, chaos, you know, that's when the government says, well, we need to restrict the Second Amendment rights. We're like, no, that's what the Second Amendment was for. The Second Amendment is for um, emergencies. And so our philosophy is the government needs to be held to that standard. They need to be bound by the chains of the Constitution, which lays out the restrictions on the government. The government has certain areas where it has legitimate power, and in those legitimate areas of the government, we want to be big and strong. But then everything else that is not expressly given to them is left to us, is left to we, the people, the sovereigns that created this government, and, and for GOA, um, that is the Second Amendment. That's the individual right to keep and bear arms without infringement by the government. So, uh, obviously, gun bans are, are bad, or serious infringement, but everybody knows that. Yeah. But so are things like concealed carry permits, where you have to go to the government to ask if you, if you could be allowed to carry a gun. That's why we push at the state level for constitutional carry. Right. Um, so are background checks instant or otherwise, which create the framework for gun owner registration. And now, of course, back in the 90s, when the government, uh, when Congress passed 
the, the instant uh, background registration check, it was only for uh, sales that went through FFLs because the federal government has this unconstitutional relationship with FFLs, so they've been regulated uh, you know, for many years. But now what are we seeing in, in today's America is, well, no, now there's this big loophole. And anytime someone in the government says loophole, think freedom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, now they want all gun sales, so even between you and I, even between individuals, uh, to go through that same type of background check. So that's why um, you know, the, the, the no compromise position isn't because we're unreasonable, it's because we understand what the Constitution means, we understand what the Second Amendment means, and, and it's the people in government, in Congress, right now in the White House, who just want to destroy that right. Mm -hmm. And the Second Amendment, you know, it's been standing for centuries. And then all of the sudden, it doesn't work anymore, let's get rid of it right away. It's like it's been it's been working though, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and people will be like, "Well, look at these active shooters." I'm like, "That's a statistical zero. You know, it, it's it's so few deaths, as you mm -hmm. pointed out. We're going to have a few hundred deaths in mass shootings mm -hmm. a year, maybe, mm -hmm. kind of thing. Of like, it statistically of like people dying of hammers or like through the roof comparatively. Oh, sure. And so to take away the rights of everyone because of such a statistic of like, well, people die in car crashes. Mm -hmm. They do. We still drive. If you eliminated cars, though, there would be no more car car crash deaths. And everyone would be, would be late to everything. It's like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. People would be like, ah, I've been quarantined at home for a year. I don't need my I'll car just, anyway. I'll just zoom in. <laughs> I'll just zoom it. Oh, zoom. But there would be hundreds of thousands of more cardiac arrests. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, to do something deaths, kills yeah. people and to do nothing kills people. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so there's the big fallacy of, well, if it even saves one life, I'm like, man, you're a moron. Yeah. Why do you suck at thinking? Why do people suck at thinking now? <laughs> you know, no, I, it's a serious question. Why does everyone kind of suck at thinking? Because it's some... Um, uh, there's just, I see a lot of propaganda and people's brains are just kind of off. I'm like, don't you see it? Don't you see how obvious it is? How can you drink in such obvious propaganda? Are you afraid or are you naive or misinformed? I don't want to say stupid. Uh, are you stupid or cowardly? Which yeah, one? Right. I mean, John, it's, 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 it's hard to look at facts because that requires you to think about things. That requires consideration. That requires you to do research. So now what we're seeing is a greater percent of people saying, you know what, just give it to me easy. We live in a, my grandparents say this, particularly about my generation, but I think this translates to just a lot of people in general. We want everything easy, we want it fast. Just, just tell me what I have to do, tell me what I should believe, tell me what I should think, and I'm okay. I'm not interested in that. I don't want you to tell me what, what I should think. I don't want you to tell me what I should do. Let me decide that for myself, and, and that means preserving my right to carry a weapon, to buy a weapon without restrictions, without someone saying, well, you know, Sir Michael, maybe you shouldn't get a weapon, maybe you should. I mean, I, I, wanna, t I wanna go here with this, John. Dr. King applied for a concealed carry, was denied. This is what I'm saying with the government. You can never trust these people to have your best interest. You guys know this. You can never trust the government to have your best interest because they'll say, well, this is what our intent is, and then slowly it'll begin to unravel into something else, mm -hmm. into, into the next thing, the other thing. But again, most people are so comfortable. They think everything's okay. They think everything is perfect. But the government says, I trust, I believe. But I think people who are watching this, your audience, members of, of Gun Owners of America, I think and these guns are, and, and Guns Out Nation, I, I think these are people who are saying, yeah, maybe there's some good stuff, government here and there, but we believe in rugged individualism. We believe that we maintain the right to do it our way. Yeah. That's important, John. And we have to begin to reach out to the rest of our fellow Americans and say, guys, we're going in the wrong direction. This country was never built by people who wanted to live in a society ran by an entity, the government or an individual. The king. That's why we started the country. They fled the Queen of England, the King of England rather, for a reason, because they wanted to go to a place where they could have their own freedoms, their own liberties, live the life that they decided was in their best interest, build the communities that they decided were good for them. But the king said, no, 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 you can't do that because I am king, I reign supreme. That's why when the founders built this country, they gave most of the power to the House of Representatives and the Senate, particularly the House though. 
So the House elections are every two years versus the Senate. It's a little complicated than that, but the House is supposed to be the best representation of the people, of the people, not the executive. But now we live in a society now where it's in the reverse. Yeah. It's the executive who decides all things for everybody. That's not the intent of this country, John, and, and we're headed in that direction. And that's why I think people have to stand up and say, we have rights that cannot be trumped. We have a constitution that governs the relationship between the sovereign people and the state. It looks like unless everyone gets smart and brave, unless those two things happen and widespread, I don't see that happening. It looks like the Second Amendment is doomed to die. That's what it looks like. Unless we get smart and brave as a group, 100 million gun owners out there, unless we all get smart and brave together, Second Amendment looks like it's going to die. How do you think, because you just mentioned executive branch, how do you think the Second Amendment really goes down? What, 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 how will that die? Well, right now it's very simple. We're, we are a couple of votes uh, in the United States Senate away from basically passing the entire Biden, Schumer, Pelosi gun control agenda. The House already passed red, a red flag gun grab bill, universal, universal background checks. They can pass a semi-auto ban in, in a minute. The thing that, that is saving us right now from Biden and, and really tyranny is the filibuster in the United States Senate which requires a 60 vote threshold to pass controversial legislation. That's the way the Senate was built to, to slow down the, the heated uh, uh, laws and bills that come out of the House and, and be more deliberative. If the Senate turns into a simple, uh, a simple majority, 51 votes, then it's just like the House. There's no difference. There is no deliberative body. It's whatever the majority party wants to pass, the majority party can pass. And when you have a, a situation like this, where you have one party in control of House, Senate, and the White House, that's extremely dangerous. Um, so there are a couple of senators on the Democrat side who are hesitant to get rid of the filibuster, but the pressure it, it mounts every day. And it, it, it's really frightening um, what they could pass if we lose this, this, le uh, um, this parliamentary um, safeguard that we have in, in the Senate. So it Let, goes yeah. with- Let's the, say it, it holds, and that's a big what if. Yeah. What can the executive branch do? And yeah. Executive orders. I mean, the White House is already contemplating, since they believe this is not going to pass through the Senate, that Biden will, through executive orders, say we're gonna ban ARs, we're going to limit magazine capacities, we're going to expand background checks, that is unconstitutional. But the problem is we've opened up this can of worms through several presidents, Republicans and Democrats. We've opened up this can of worms. And again, you read the Federalist Papers, you read the Constitutions, folks. This was not the intent of the founders, John. The executive was never supposed to have so much supremacy, so much power that there essentially isn't the need for checks and balances anymore. We might as well get rid of the Supreme Court, get rid of Congress, both houses, and just say we have a president a king forever, essentially. That, that's literally what we have. But isn't he acting like a king? I mean, he moved in the White House under, you know, had a military guard, erected a huge <laughs> fence around the White House, won't talk to us via press conferences, which has never been done in presidential history to go this long without any type of, mm -hmm. he's not even talking with us. He's not interested in it. And then he just crams through more executive orders than like the last 10 presidents put together. Isn't that He's acting like a little king, isn't he? No, he, he, he literally is. And, and I think, you know, Biden ran on this whole idea of I want to return America and bring Democrats and Republicans together. And that's what he said. Of course. That, that's what he said. And regardless of your views on Biden, your views on President Trump, I think all Americans, all good Christian people want the leaders to do well. That's what the Bible teaches us, to pray for our leaders. And I think most of you people probably do that. The problem is what happens when the leaders trump the right of the individuals. That's essentially what we're doing vis-a-vis -vis these executive orders, John. And so I, I think that people of good standing, they got to call Congress. They have to call some of those Democrats, John, and they have to tell those folks, you have to stand up or we will get you out of there. 
Yeah. We it's, will we will vote you out. And support Gun Owners America. Give these yeah. guys some money so that you can seriously take yeah. that money and transfer it into uh, activism in the political sphere. Yeah. That's what you do, right? It is. Yeah. And, and, and I think Sir Michael ma makes a great point, is that on, on the Democrat side right now at the national level, the, there is no balance. Right. They, they are run by the extreme mm -hmm. left because after you know, uh, President Obama in, in 2009, 10, passed Obamacare, he had um, control of the House and, and the Senate. And in, the, in that first off-year election, he lost 60 Democrats, 60 in one election in the United States House. And those 60 were kind of center and maybe we would say a little bit to the right. I wouldn't say they were strong to the right. but. So the Democrat Party went really hard uh, to the left. But in addition, we need to change the mindset of people in certain, in, in, in our cities. That's why Gunners of America is, is proud to be behind Guns Out TV because these gentlemen, Sir Michael and John, are taking the message where it really needs to be heard. Because when we talk about gun control, you know, does it work? Won't, won't it make us safer? You know, the sad thing is we know the answer to that question. You could read it in the newspaper every day. Look at Chicago, look at Detroit, look at our cities run by one party that make it extremely hard to, to own guns, to carry, to carry guns you know, out, out of doors. And we need to bring this message that it doesn't have to be this way. You don't have to live. You know, the, the, the Second Amendment's not just for the country. It's not only for the farm or for the rural areas or for the hunters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what about the, the single mother with three children in Section 8 housing? Doesn't she have rights? Mm -hmm. What about people in the HUD system? You know, HUD under, um, under Bill Clinton tried to ban yep. guns. Yep. Um, but no, it should be the opposite. Uh, you know, we, we have cities trying to buy back guns as if the government owned them in the first place. Mm -hmm. No, they, they should be, doing everything they can to help people have guns and level that playing field with the criminal. And if, if we can turn these, these uh, uh, inner cities, the Philadelphias, that are really controlling the states, you know, all of California isn't bad. Yeah. San Francisco and Los Angeles are. You know, all of Michigan isn't bad, but Detroit, you know, they have such a, a, a hold on power and with Things like Guns Out TV, what, what you guys are doing, you know, we're bringing that message home that we don't have to be sheep, we don't have to be defenseless. You know, we have the right to defend ourselves no matter your color, your gender, your, your income level, no matter what, we all have the same rights. They're human. Um, here's a million dollar question. Million dollars, because that's how much a box of nine mil costs right now. Uh, million dollar question. <laughs> Uh, let's say AR-15s become illegal tomorrow. Uh, you all own AR-15s? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for that, good. Uh, that was kind of like a, you, Be you better? better? <laughs> John, you're right, I'm like, you better own, own AR you leave and you go fix right. yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing in stock, in stock, so good luck. What are you gonna do when AR-15s are illegal tomorrow? You gonna turn yours in? Nope. Uh, t to me, that's illegal, right? Gun control is racist. You're going to break the law? It's, it's, it's racist. You know, well, John brought up the inner city stuff. And, and, and John, you know, we, we, we've talked about this, the importance of expanding our community yeah, of yeah. 2A. Because I fundamentally believe education, real education, not telling someone what to think and how to do it, but educating people is important, it's pivotal, it's key. And I think we have to start pushing back against this narrative particularly among a lot of progressive people who want to dictate to certain people of certain communities how they should think and what they should think. We have to reach out to those folks and, and, and tell them, no, 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 this isn't 400 years ago. No one gets to dictate your life anymore. You have the freedom and liberty to dictate that for yourself. The Second Amendment makes you equal. But some folks don't want people to believe but that. But if they make a new law that says it's illegal to have an AR-15, are you ready to be lawbreakers? Nope. The I'm, Second well, Amendment, it, it, it's a protected right. It's constitutionally protected. Mm -hmm. It is not government granted. Mm -hmm. And the minute that we surrender our rights is the moment that we say, you know what, me as an individual, I don't matter. I am just a pawn in the government's hands. And that is the moment that you become fully controlled.
and if the constitution if constitution is the highest level law of the land if you make a inferior law that contradicts it that's an illegal law and you don't have to follow yeah. it yeah. never ever give up your guns never never just don't just keep them bury them if you have to but don't give them up bury them <laughs> because one day you'll need them no you're, you're right i mean look look at what happened in australia we were just talking about this where they just took people's guns away mm -hmm. and if you look at the news reports months after that home invasions I mean, every type of horrendous crime you could think of, increased, John, yeah. increased significantly. That's a small place. Mm -hmm. Imagine what will happen in the United States of America. Right. We, 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 we cannot be movable on this, John. I've been in politics, man, a while, and I'm all about debating complicated issues. But there are some things that I'm not willing to move on. There are some things we cannot be willing to compromise on. And my ability to defend myself, to protect myself, I am not trusting another person to do that. You would be foolish to do that. That's right. That's good. And the people who are watching this are not foolish. Not my community. Uh -uh. These guys are awesome. Hey, uh, folks, thanks so much. Gun Owners of America and Guns Out, we, we love what you guys are doing. We're supporting you. You guys are awesome. Uh, so thanks for coming on. Uh, Guns Out, we have got all kinds of cool little plans. So if you want to see more of these guys, look to our network, hang out with us, and we'll put them in front of you. If you don't want to hang out with them, then you're a racist. <laughs> <laughs> so, have you been talking to Joe Biden, John? I'm just saying, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm saying, if you don't immediately you don't like, like you guys, like you're saying. racist. Or if you're just <laughs> you white black. in general. Or if you've seen the color white. Everyone's racist. <laughs> Because it's 2021 it's and right. everyone's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> guys, thanks so much for thanks, uh, coming yeah, on. Man, I feel like we should shake hands, but that's not very efficient. How about all in the center? Or I'm shaking we do your a high hand, five? <laughs> <laughs> You guys are awesome. Thanks, uh, thanks, folks, John. their information will be down below. Uh, so make sure you check that out. Thanks for tuning in. Train hard, train smart. And above all, guys, stay free. Stay free. See ya.